You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Yes, I have some good questions to uh, get stuck into today from the old uh, stockpile of questions I get sent in via Facebook or Instagram or different places like that. So um, thank you for those. I look forward to um, getting stuck into those in a moment. If you are new to the podcast, head on over to anxietypodcast.com where you can get the End Anxiety Toolkit and the five-week course and stuff like that. Uh, also wanted to take a moment to thank my patrons, people who uh, throw down a monthly donation or sponsorship or whatever you want to call it to uh, support the running of the show, which is uh, very much appreciated. If you also want to become a patron, which you probably should do, is the right thing to do, is the responsible thing to do, you can go to uh, anxietypodcast.com, click on the membership tab and that will direct you there or just go to patreon.com forward slash anxiety podcast. Also, would like to thank my ongoing sponsor, Avita- uh, I nearly got that wrong, BetterHelp. Um, better help. Uh, yeah, they're online counseling. So they're really going to help you with, um, any kind of, well, they work with a variety of different things. So things like depression, stress, anxiety, some of the, you know, a lot of the stuff we talk about here on the anxiety podcast, relationships, sleeping, anger, all sorts of different things. And, um, it's useful because they can get you up and going really fast. Within 24 hours, you'll be having your first conversation. Um, it's not self-help. It is professional counseling. Um, you can send messages to your counselors anytime. So you can really, you know, pick your cadence um, and they'll look for somebody who's a good fit. If you don't have a good fit with your initial person, you can change. So it's good. It's professional. It's affordable. It's uh, You can check out testimonials on their website if you like. And in fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counsellors in all 50 states. So I can offer you through this promotion 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash anxiety podcast. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash anxiety podcast. So there we go taking care of sponsors, little updates, personal updates. Um, yeah, things have been um, things have been sort of buzzing along uh, in my life as it relates to um, my, my work on the real estate side, um, my health and fitness stuff. Actually, for the first time in a while, months, uh, I went back to the gym this week, which was really enjoyable. <laughs> I really liked it. Seeing other people, not very many people, but seeing a few other people is a good thing. Uh, but yeah, I've been, when COVID started, they closed my local gym, which I'd recently joined. I think I joined it in January and it closed in March, which is a bit of a shame, but beautiful brand new facility. They shut it down and then they said they were going out of business, which was even more of a shame. Um, and so I started working out at home, which is fine. And I, I have all the equipment, but there's something to be said for people watching you work out in terms of, I don't know why that creates more accountability just being around strangers who are also working out. But for some reason it does, it creates more accountability. You try a bit harder to do those extra reps because there's other people around and you don't want to give up on number two. You want to do four or five or six. Uh, and I think also just the environment, it's bright, it's colorful. Um, my gym at home is a bit dark and, you know, I have been in love with my home gym because it's been all I've had for for a while here. But um, it's nice to get back to the big old uh, gym out there in the world. And the other thing is variety because at home I end up doing the same exercises quite a lot. And obviously you can have quite a lot of flexibility with a barbell and dumbbells and benches and stuff like that. But, you know, sometimes I like to use the fancy machines and uh, they have rowing machines and all sorts of stuff. they got everything. So anyway, it got bought out by a new company. And uh, they changed the name a little bit. They took half the name away. It used to be associated with a famous basketball player and he's got nothing to do with it anymore. So now it's just called Fitness World. But um, I went back and uh, I went back on Friday, I think, for the first time. And there's only like five people in there. This place is massive. There's only five people in there, very spaced out. So that was good. I really enjoyed it. And then I went back again this morning 
And uh, I realized that, you know, I, I seem to have to learn this lesson frequently. But when I try and say, right, I've got stuff in the morning, I work out in the afternoon or evening, it just doesn't happen. It never happens. Get too busy. Stuff goes on. Kids get involved. Got to make dinner, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so, yeah, back to this morning, went and got it done nice and early. And then you just feel good for the whole day. You can reflect on the fact you've already conquered something difficult in your life. You've already done the workout. Whereas when you're going to do it at the end of the day, you sit there all day thinking, oh, I've got to work out tonight. I've got to work out tonight. And then you get to it and you have to kind of force yourself through it and it's painful and hurts and stuff. When you work out in the morning, you're still asleep. You can't really feel it. It's really good. So I've already done that and um, feel very accomplished. It's a beautiful day here on Vancouver Island. And yeah, aside from that, just been enjoying um, the weather. As you no doubt know, if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, I'm busy sort of starting a new new career. Um, I've been in real estate as a whole for some years, but um, I finally took the plunge and became a realtor, real estate agent in, uh, yeah, in June. I think I officially got my license and started practicing. So that's been just busy and fun and coming across loads of super nice, enthusiastic, encouraging people in fellow realtors and uh, people in the business getting to help people purchase their house, which is a massive, uh, who would have thought the connection between anxiety, stress and business, but there it is right there. When you buy a house, it's super stressful. There's loads of anxiety. Um, We've been going through dealing with you know, multiple offers and competition and not knowing if you're going to get it or not. So there's some anxiety involved and I feel it a little bit as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of been what I've been up to is is working a lot on that and some fa- working on some family stuff as well. And um, yeah, just trying to stay healthy and on, on, uh, on my game in addition to all that stuff in terms of um, taking care of my diet and doing my exercise. And I mean, it doesn't, for me, holding, maintaining that habit, I know I talk a lot about habits and people ask me a lot about habits. For me now, it's become so entrenched in my life that it's very hard not to do that. It's harder not to do it than it is to do it. Um, I just stick to the plan. Um, and yeah, it seems to work quite well. I do, you know, I have this little, I have a number of, of kind of where I want to stay um, from a a weight point of view and, and a health point of view. And so I weigh myself regularly. And if I get creeped towards that, I just back off on the old intake of food a little bit, back off on the calories, weight goes down a little bit. It's amazing how that happens, magic. And then uh, if it creeps back up again, then I just, you know, I just maintain, I stay in that sort of band of acceptability that I've created. And um, that seems to be working for me at the moment. Um, I did. Oh, I, I know I've re- I've shared in the past that I haven't drank alcohol for a long time. I did the other day. Didn't end well. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, went around to some friend's house um, and they were making Korean barbecue for us, which was amazing, delicious. Um, yeah, so good. I've got to do that again. But we were drinking a few beers and we were putting this Korean um, liquor in it, which apparently is the Korean version of vodka it's called soju we had peach flavored soju so we having a little bit of beer putting a little bit of that in the top and it was very easy to drink at the time i thought oh this is harmless nothing to it fast forward to the end of the night or the following morning and i just had like the worst hangover i've had in some time and it was a good reminder of why i don't drink very often and it took me probably three or four days to feel better again and uh felt a bit anxious in the middle of there as well so there you go this uh, if you want to see what it feels like, then, um, you know, we're only human and uh, I still make lots of mistakes in my life and and occasionally having a few too many drinks in, you know, I get caught up in the moment. I get caught up in the emotion of this is really fun and we're having great food and yeah, I'll have another drink and yeah, I'll have another drink. And then, you know, before you know it, you've had five or six drinks and you're going to feel shocking tomorrow. Anyway, let's get on to some AMA. Let's get on to some ask me anything questions because that's uh, what I like talking about. So this one um, says that they've, this is COVID-19 related. We're still in the midst of COVID-19. I think it's just going to keep going on for a while, to be honest. And I think we've got to do our best to navigate around it and, um, you know, continue to live our lives with the new not the new normal. I'm not going to say that. I nearly yawned then. Sorry. Stay awake, Tim. <laughs> it's because I got up early and went to the gym. Um, yeah, because of 
you know, that not new normal, but we've, we've adjusted, right? Humans have one of the things I really admire about the human race is our ability to endure and our ability to be flexible and change and be different. And you go out now and there's people wearing masks and plexiglass screens up to stop you spraying saliva all over each other. Um, and we carry on and we do our best. And that's, that's kind of cool in my book. I think that's good. Uh, this person says, They've been suffering greatly with anxiety due to COVID-19. I've been suffering with being furloughed and not having a routine that I've become um, dependent on my partner and called them a lot. And uh, now it, it says, unfortunately, they've left me and I've, I feel like I've lost them for good. Um, so there's a few things in there I would like to talk about. And again, I'm when I read out these questions, if you ever want to send me a question, I won't use your name. I won't use specific things that would identify you because it's not really the point. Um, unless you want me to say, like, give me a shout out, then I can totally do that. But most of the time, there's just things, there's themes in here which are running through these questions, which are just lots of people are dealing with different things. So that's all I try and do is try and pick up a few bits and pieces from that and then extrapolate those and, and pull some value out of it. Furloughed. I never even knew what furloughed meant before COVID-19. Um, if I felt like it was invented for this reason. But anyway, a lot of people were um, laid off from work or diminished hours. I was for a while in my previous job. Um, and uh, now I kind of make my own hours a little bit, I suppose. But yeah, for sure that people's job routine getting impacted then changed their life routine in terms of what they would do and and you know you then have the um, propensity to become codependent on other people and i think codependency and anxiety are very familiar places anyway in terms of people who are suffering with anxiety will often reach out to familiar people in their lives or in the network um, or friend groups and say, hey, I need some help now because I'm struggling, I'm having a panic attack or I feel super anxious. And they, you know, we tend to lean on people who are willing to be leaned on, if that makes sense. Um, we gravitate towards those who are most sympathetic to our plight. And um, that's why sometimes it's counterproductive to for, for people to be so accommodating um, and so comfortable with having conversations when we're struggling Sometimes it doesn't allow us to experience emotions on our own, right? Sometimes you need help, and I totally understand that and been there myself and been in dark places in my life where I've really wanted somebody to take care of me, but there's other times where maybe it would be too easy just to pick up the phone and, and bypass the emotions um, and, and just talk to somebody else about it. So sometimes you need to feel it. So I think that codependency piece is, is interesting, Um I think the other thing I pull out of this question, which is something I talk about periodically, is that I think when we're becoming dependent on other people, we're, we're losing our own independence. And, and that's really a big foundational piece of, of dealing with anxiety, a foundational piece of building confidence in how we can become self-sustaining um, and take care of ourselves, irrespective of other people in the world or other people in our lives. Because I think if you, if you, as a human, if you rely on other people to define your happiness or you rely on other people to define your life or your health, even for that matter, like, you know, if you're, if you're saying, well, if my partner doesn't eat well, then I can't eat well. Well, guess what? Somebody has to go first, right? That's not an excuse. It's, it's up to you. You get to choose what goes in your body. Um, there might be financial limitations in terms of what types of things you can buy, but you know we're very fortunate in many places in the world that we still can buy reasonably healthy options for not a huge amount of money, right? Um, and so if you can't afford fresh vegetables because they're expensive, buy bags of frozen broccoli like I often do <laughs> and just throw them into my dinner. Um, so yeah, I think you know, that just kind of screams out at me from, from this type of question is building independence is super important in terms of your um, resilience as a human being. Knowing and having that confidence, belief and certainty that you can endure, even if you're on your own, even if you're left um, to your own devices for, an, uh, for a longer period of time, even if the relationship you're currently in ends, can you do it on your own? 
Um, can you survive on your own? Can you thrive on your own? Can you, f- you know, feed yourself and clothe yourself and all the rest of it? We've got to be able to do that. It's kind of like raising children. The more I do for my kids, and I do a tremendous amount for them because I'm I'm a server by nature. I'm a helper by nature. I love cooking dinner and working all day and serving people and and tucking the kids in. Like I do, I do all those things, but then I'm I'm raising children who can't do anything if I do all of it. Right? I. You know, I enjoy washing dishes, strangely, sometimes. Not all the time, but um, not if somebody's cooked eggs in the frying pan. It takes ages to get off. But I do enjoy washing dishes sometimes. Me and my older brother used to wash dishes and um, have have a laugh doing it. But, uh, yeah, my kids don't think it's fun to <laughs> make up songs while washing dishes in the kitchen like we used to back in the day. Um, but, anyway, a little bit of a... Little bit of a a digression, but ultimately knowing and having that self-confidence and that foundational belief in yourself, right? Think about the connection between self-belief and anxiety. The more you develop your self-belief, self-confidence, self-esteem, all these self-things on your own for yourself, not in a selfish way, but on your own, you you, you have those. You're an individual, you're independent and you can you can deal with it. You don't have then then coming into a romantic relationship or any kind of relationship at all, you're in such a more of a powerful position. Not that you're trying to make a power move, but you're in a powerful position because you don't have to have it. You might want to have it, but you don't have to have it, right? Way more attractive, way more strength, way better for your emotional well-being. You don't need to be needy. You don't need to worry about, oh, they haven't phoned me back in five minutes. Now what am I going to do? I texted them three times and they haven't texted me. I can't text them again. That would be too needy or too many or et cetera, right? You have your own stuff going on. It's attractive. The world over, right? People are learning. If people are learning and you know, with their minds or developing their minds or developing their bodies or having a routine, you need, think about it, sit back and think about it. If you meet somebody who has a routine, we're often uh, impressed or attracted to that. If somebody says, right, you know, I do the I do these sequence of things on a regular basis because it makes me feel good. That's attractive. Why is it attractive? Because it's hard to do. It's hard to develop a routine and stick to it. It's easy to, well, I don't know about easy, but it's, we often float down the river like a, like a leaf um, we just kind of go with the flow, right? We we wake up and, and do our thing and, and fill in the gaps with whatever we can to make ourselves feel good, um, which often may be, you know, um, social media or junk food or Netflix or alcohol or whatever, right? We fill in the gaps. But to have a routine and stick to a routine is attractive. So I think um, it's amazing how much I can talk about a sentence or two that somebody's written but i think you know developing your own routine and working on your own life even in the midst of having romantic or relationship based difficulties with somebody else you've got to bring it back to you because you know like the analogy of chasing the wild animal if you chase after things they run away from you you have to you have to attract not repel things, right? Think of the uh, the magnet. You know, if you're if you're if you're pushing um, the the wrong side of a, a magnet, it's going to push away. But if you turn it around, it attracts towards you. So, yeah, I can't. I don't know what else to say apart from some firsthand experience in my life about you know the people who do their own thing and. Uh, engage with you and stuff is just way more enticing than 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 people who are constantly asking for help or to be saved or um you know that that only works sometimes and and ultimately we need to save ourselves and ultimately we need to build the resources a lot of you wonderful people listening to this have already taken a step you've already found some resources you're listening to a podcast you're developing yourself right i do it all the time i think right i need to learn more about x i find the podcast i start educating myself i learn more and then i implement it and then i get results it's not you know it's difficult but it's also very easy it's very easy to do the thing you want to do you learn how to do it 
or find somebody else who's done it before you and had success, emulate them, copy them, read about them or whatever, listen to them talk about it, go and implement, rinse and repeat, adjust to your own lifestyle and personality, et cetera, et cetera, and you'll have results. It works. It happens all the time. All right. Um, so that's that one. Um, all right. This one's good as well. Another good question. So this is talking about people's expectations of you. Um, I love the podcast has helped me in so many ways on so many occasions on the past over the past few years. Thank you. I wanted to ask you how you manage other people's expectations of you, whether that's family or friends who offer you advice about what you should be doing with life, work or relationships and how you navigate listening to that advice without it influencing your life too much or being the deciding factor of your choices. My anxiety often means that I please others and go along with what friends or family say I should be doing just to have an easier life, whether this is what I want or not. Any advice on how you listen, any advice on how you listen to advice would be, uh, without it overwhelming, your decisions would be very helpful. Thanks for that question. That's a wonderful question. It's a really good one. Um, Advice. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think, again, this is just such a deep subject in terms of um, a, a number of things, other people's expectations of you, other people's type of advice. Some people want to some people like you the way you are. This is going to sound really weird to say. Some people probably like the fact you've got anxiety. Some people in your life probably like the fact you've got anxiety because it, it, it's, uh, it keeps you, um, you know, confined in some ways. And for some people that might be convenient. I don't know. I've, I've definitely seen elements of that before with people. Um, because if you bust out and you fully, you know, turn into the butterfly and spread your wings then who knows where that might take you it might take you into a different relationship or a different country or a different job or a different body you know it might take you in loads of different places and that makes other people uncomfortable change in yourself makes other people uncomfortable it does because it causes reflection and people hate reflection of themselves they don't like mirrors it makes people feel uncomfortable right so think about all Many of the things I've talked about in the past, if you've, you know, given up alcohol for a period of time, even if you say, right, I'm quitting alcohol for a month, not going teetotal forever, but I'm giving up alcohol for a month. Watch how much that triggers people around you. Or if you say, I'm going on a diet because um, I want to get in better shape. People will say, well, there's nothing wrong with your shape now, you know, and, and, and on and on. And you'll hear things about that. Or if you want to say... And I've been through a lot of these myself personally, so I've, I've experienced it firsthand. Um, or you want to move geographies, you know, you want to move countries or move cities or whatever. Also triggers people. Why are you moving? What's wrong with it here? It's fine. I'm staying here. Why are you leaving? You can't leave. Um, so all all of those things are other people's projections. What they're doing is they're projecting how they feel about themselves onto you based on something you're doing, which is very strange. But that's what's happening. And so that comes through in their expectations of you. Or maybe they're afraid you're going to fail. And and that makes them worried about the repercussions for you. Maybe it does come from a good place sometimes. But one of the things I've learned in my life after making quite a few sharp turns in terms of uh, careers and um, locations is that you can you can really sort of you can really come back from anything pretty much and you can really make changes and make an impact quite quickly into it in a, in a new place and so all and you don't lose everything that you had because all the stuff you've been doing over your life is your body of work like you've been doing and learning and building and to, to sort of get where you are so um yeah I don't really ask for people's advice anymore. (laughs) That's the difference. Um, I I definitely care what people think because I'm I'm wired that way, probably from, I don't know, um, wired that way from my childhood, wired about trying to please my parents probably and and my siblings and stuff. I definitely care what people think, but I don't don't ask many people for advice. There's probably one or two people's advice I ask, um, one of those being my wife because, you know, she's my wife and 
she knows me very well and um many of the prophecies that she's made in the past um I, when she first suggests them i'm like no that will never work i'm not doing that and then six months later i'm like i got an idea what do you think she's like we talked about this i'm like oh yeah damn it you were right i should have done that but anyway so i don't don't ask for advice for many people but i think you know part of it initially comes from just getting quiet and being quiet in yourself and saying what do i want what do you want you know it's kind of that that question i love of like if you didn't have an anxiety anymore what would you do with your life if you weren't afraid what would you do big things my friend big things you would do big things we can all do those big things um because the only way to not be afraid is to do them that's it that's the secret that I've learnt over years of talking about this stuff is that I only get over my anxiety of instances and situations and stuff by doing those things and having those difficult conversations and making hard changes and running toward difficult problems and conversations and being surprised that it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. In almost every case, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It wasn't as bad as the you know, the night spent with dual pain and severe anxiety and feeling horrific. Nothing's that bad in practice. So the fear is worse than the actual event that you're afraid of. The, f- the fear of the conversation is way worse than the conversation. The fear of the move is harder than the move. So, and and it may be that friends and family offer you advice because you kind of, you, you, you're looking like you need it or you're, you're, you're asking for it in some, you know, in a verbal or non-verbal way by not being decisive and not taking your life by the horns and being in charge. You're basically saying, I don't know what to do. So feel free to comment as I go along and try and fix me and, you know, direct me in the right place, you know. So what do you want to do for work or relationships? What do you want to do if if there was no downside or if you failed you know, if you weren't afraid of failing rather, what would you do then? Right. Those are some things to think about. Um, I am so happy to uh, share those questions with you today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, Please leave a review wherever you listen to this. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, Go to the anxietypodcast.com.